Hi everyone, this week we are programming a Stroop experiment in JS Psych. I'm working on my fourth blog post and that's what you'll be doing this week also. And so let's check it out. Let's see, here's what we're gonna cover. Briefly, what is a Stroop experiment? I think we all know what it is already. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just show you an example of one that I already made in JS Psych so that we know what we're working towards. And I'm gonna point you to these two papers. Uh, this one shows examples of how the size of a Stroop effect depends on how you have people respond to the stimuli, either by asking them to press a button to type their response or to say their response out loud. And this one is a classic review paper from 1991, uh, reviewing 50 years of research on Stroop effects. There's a lot of information in that paper. Then we're gonna head into programming a basic Stroop experiment from scratch. Uh, yeah, mostly from, yeah, okay, I'll, we'll do it from scratch. We'll, I might do some pausing and then just uh, copy pasting some previous things I've done and then talk about it, but we'll basically build this up from scratch. And if we have time in the video, I'll consider some of these additional elements to a Stroop experiment, um, but we may also just talk about these things in class. When I'm done, there'll be links to example code, and um, we'll talk about your assignment at the end. To give you a preview, I want you to make sure you can get a Stroop experiment running on your Quarto blog. Feel free to try to program it yourself, but you could also try to get the tutorial working on your blog as well. That'd be fine. And then the main thing here is brainstorm a manipulation that you think might change the size of the Stroop effect. Something that would make it bigger something or something that would make it smaller uh, between two different conditions. I give you an example here. Your task is to see if you can modify the code or write your own to implement this manipulation. And then we'll start looking into data analysis next week. But if you want to go ahead, you know, after you've run your experiment, uh, you could pilot yourself, run yourself through it a couple of times. The question is, did your own, were you able to successfully manipulate, measure your own Stroop effect in both of those conditions? And uh, did it change size in the way you expected it would? So to do this, we'll have to get the data out of JS Psych and analyze it somehow. Like I said, we'll cover that next week. All right, I just jumped over to my Intro to Cognition uh, web page and in the 10th learning module over there, there's a attention section. And one of the uh, ways students can participate in, in that section is to try a Stroop experiment. So if we click this link, we should see an example of something we're gonna try to build in, in this tutorial. So we've got a consent form, a demographic survey, and then some really basic instructions. It says, uh, in this task, you will see a word in a color. Okay, so we've got the word blue in the color red. And it's asking us to press R, G, B, or Y to identify the color, not the word. So press R for red in this example. Make your responses as quickly and accurately as possible. Press any key to begin. I'm gonna get my fingers on the keyboard. Uh, see if I can find the RGBY. I'm ready to go. And okay. So we're seeing different types of Stroop stimuli. Uh, and we're getting feedback, we're getting instructions on what to do each trial. Notice sometimes the word and color are different. I didn't respond. This one, that, that was a, so this is an incongruent trial when the word and color are different. That's another incongruent trial. Sometimes the word and color are the same, like that one. That's called a congruent trial. All right, so I've stopped responding to this. Uh, there's several trials in this experiment. Half of the trials are of this congruent variety where the word and color match, and half of the trials are of the incongruent variety where the word and color don't match. And in this case, I only have four colors that I'm using and four color words red, green, blue, and yellow. 
So that is a really basic Stroop experiment. If I was to uh, collect data on this experiment and look at the mean reaction time for congruent trials, you'll typically, uh, typically find that your reaction times are faster when the word and color match compared to the incongruent trials when the word and color don't match. And that difference is referred to as the Stroop effect. So we are about to program one of these experiments in JS Psych from scratch. Let's get on with it. I'm going to head over to my RStudio program. Here we are, and I've got a folder for week four. This is my blog post that I was writing. This RMD file is an old version of a Stroop experiment that I wrote a while back. And I'm going to actually rename that here. Um, OK, I, I'm, I might refer to this file later. So the first thing we need to do is make a brand new text file. And we could call this stroop.html. So there we are. We really are starting from scratch. And sometimes that can be daunting. Now, typically, I never would actually start from scratch. And so I'm going to do what I typically do here, which is uh, copy from something I made before. This is a pretty common strategy. So let's go back to the JS Psych tutorial. And we were making that simple reaction time test. Let's open up all of that stuff. Because this is a basic template. So copy that. And paste it in here. That's how I would typically start. And you can go get that uh, exact file from the JS Psych website from last time. You know, if you go down to the bottom of the tutorial, you can just copy that whole thing. So now I'm back in my week four folder and I just copied it right into my Stroop file. And I'm going to do a whole bunch of deleting just to clean it up. I'm going to leave everything in the head the same. We'll probably use some of the same plugins. Uh, we'll definitely use the HTML keyboard response. Actually, that's the one we'll use. I don't think we really need the image keyboard response here. We could get rid of that later. What else are we going to keep? So this is the initializer. That's good to keep. This is the timeline. We'll need a timeline in our experiment. We'll keep that. This is for preloading images. Well, we don't have any images in this experiment, so we could delete that. We've got a welcome screen from last time, and that seems pretty good. How about we keep that? Um, what about a instruction screen? Well, we're going to need instructions. So we, we're going to have to delete this and write our own instructions, but the, the whole plugin, I think we can keep it and use this to help us write our instructions. Uh, okay, now we've got a whole bunch of other stuff that could be useful to keep or not keep. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and delete everything up to these instructions. And then Let's think about, okay, we've got a welcome screen and an instruction screen. I'm going to delete preload, push to timeline, delete these other things so that, so my goal here is really to have a little bare bones starting point and then be able to verify that I can load it in uh, my browser and make sure that I haven't any, made any mistakes yet. So I will open up this Stroop thing in Firefox. All right, I loaded it up. I'm getting a blank screen. Suggest something is wrong. And you might already know what it is if you've been following along and watching what I did. Uh, so if we go to the web developer tools, we're going to see a warning here. It's, uh, it's failing to load these different scripts. It can't find the plugin. It can't find the JS files. And so what's going on here is at the top, we're saying, go and get those things in the JS Psych folder. 
and there isn't one in our week four blog folder. That happens to be in the week three folder. And uh, we got to solve this problem. So, um, the, I mean, there's two ways to do it. And this time, let's make use of the web-based way of doing it. And we can solve the file-based problem some other time. Okay. So, I'm still in my Stroop file. I want to make sure that I'm back into week four here in case I need to see what's going on. And remember this part up here. This is where we're loading the JS psych files that we need, but we're doing it from the internet. So I'm going to uncomment this section. And I'm going to comment out this section down here. And so far, I'm seeing, yeah, I think this should be sufficient for our purposes. We just need to load the regular jsyc.js file, this plugin, and the CSS file. So if we do it like that, we should be able to go back to this page here, reload, and see that things are working now. We we'll get the instruction screen, we get the Oh, sorry, we got the welcome screen, then the instruction screen, and we're, we don't see those images because we have, don't have that in our folder either. Okay, no problem. Uh, yeah, let's, I mean, we could write the instructions right now. We could write them later. Um, I'm going to, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm going to pause and write instructions real quick. All right, we've got some instructions in there. Those were the same ones as before that I showed you in the demo. Okay, so what are we seeing here? That looks pretty messed up. I'm not sure why there's these plus signs everywhere. Uh, okay. I was borrowing code from a different way of doing it. And I need to I need to go in here and delete all these places where there's a plus. I was making use of a something that's kind of neat about JavaScript that I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but I think I fixed the problem here. So we should be able to reload it to get the instructions to work. Okay. So remember, we've surrounded some HTML in between backticks, which, which lets you write in a multi-line format. And then I, I just wrote some HTML for these instructions here. Um, previously, each of those lines was wrapped in a quotation mark and a uh, little plus was after each one. Let me just show you what that does. So if you have uh, some words and you do a plus and you do some more words, what happens is they get, uh, basically um, they get concatenated together. And just like that. Uh, if you wanted to have a space, you'd have to put a space in between one of those things like this. So if you have two strings that are in between quotation marks, you can add them together, which results in creating one larger string with all of the pieces in one long string. And I was making use of that property before to write my instructions. Okay, so the next part is to kind of think about what we need to do. Um, we might write some goals uh, such as make, oops, I need to remember how to do a comment in JavaScript. And that's two slashes. 
So right now I'm just going to make this a bit bigger to look at and talk about setting goals. I'll maybe delete this in a minute, but we need to make Stroop stimuli. Um, and we need to um, figure out how to present them using JS Psych. So these are some general goals. If we look back at the previous example, which I deleted, but we can see it here. Um, we made a an array object that we used to define uh, stimuli in that experiment, and it had this type of property. So um, it's an array, and inside of the array we have uh, two objects, this one and this one. They each have a stimulus property, and in this case we see the stimulus is the link to a an image file. And they have some other properties that say what the correct response is. So later on, um, we use JS Psych plugins to display a fixation cross and to display that image to collect a response. And those plugins go through the stimuli that are listed here and randomly choose between these ones to display it. So we, I think we can use a really similar strategy for a basic Stroop experiment. I'm just gonna copy this and put it right here in our Stroop document. I'm gonna call this Stroop Stimuli. I think that's a good title. And the next thing we need to do is start modifying this for our own purposes. So the stimulus is no longer going to be a link to an image file. What it could be instead is the HTML required to present a word in a particular color. So let's see if I've got the chops to do this by memory. Let's say we're talking about the word red. So this is a paragraph element for the word red. We could say the correct response would be the letter R. And um, well, right now, if we were to present that on, on the web, uh, in a web browser, it would just be printed in black. And I guess that's okay, but we wanna be able to print it in a different color. Um, either red, green, blue, or yellow, let's say. It is possible to set the color of this using a style property. And I'm gonna go find the right syntax for that. All right, I'm back. Actually, we could have uh, taken it from the instructions here. So after the first P, I just pasted in some things here. This is a style property and it equals, and then we've got some text in between single quotes. We're setting the color to be red and we're setting the font size to be 60 point font. And this is going to um, make the word here be presented in the color red and uh, so on. So we are getting close. I'm going to add a few more things. So first of all, I'm just gonna make this a little bit smaller for myself. Uh, I wanna add more properties to this first thing because that will be useful for data analysis later on. So for example, Uh, I would like to know whether this is a congruent or incongruent item. So I call, I created a, a, a congruency 
uh, name. And I did something wrong. That shouldn't be an equals. That should be a colon. Now, I'm just going to uh, rearrange things so they're easier to see. So this whole block is a Stroop stimulus. being defined here. The stimulus is going to be displayed as this HTML. We're giving it this label. The correct responses are. If we wanted to be even more specific, uh, we could say do something like this. Say what the word is. Say what the color is. Oops, red and so on. So this is a nice description of our Stroop stimulus. Uh, let's do another one. So let's, let's try making the word red appear in the color green. So I just have to change that to green. We've still got the word red we got the color green, and this is going to be an incongruent type. And the correct response here would be the G key. OK, I think we're making progress. So if, if we've done this correctly, we should be able to go over to our experiment, reload it, and look for the variable Stroop stimuli. There it is. And then we should be able to look in there. Whoops. To check it out. So there's our array. And it looks like it's been defined properly. So the first object, it's got a stimulus property, all these other things. Second obj object has the other ones. Great. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm just going to do those two right now. You could see what I'm doing. If you wanted to add more, you could just continue to copy paste these blocks and change the word and the color and all the information as needed. If you have uh, four colors like red, green, blue, and yellow, there's four possible congruent types um, and 12 possible incongruent types. So you'd have to have one for each here. I'll, I'll make a note that uh, sometimes it's faster to just write these things by hand. Other times when your stimulus definitions become more complicated, it would be a good idea to write a little function to generate your stimuli for you. And if we have time later in this video, I will show an example of doing that. So the idea there is you would write a function that would take as inputs things like red, green, blue, and yellow. So you get to say, well, I want these colors. And then run the function, and the function will produce this type of variable for you by going through the colors, making all the combinations, figuring out whether they're congruent or incongruent, and then uh, constructing a variable like this. The nice thing about having a function doing it for you is that it will not have human error involved unless you made a mistake in the function. Here, because we're just writing things down, uh, you could just accidentally write the wrong thing down. And, and we're looking for methods to prevent that as well. But I want to, I'll stop here for now, just to continue on with the example. So we have our Stroop definition, our Stroop stimuli defined. The next thing we want to be able to do is present them on the screen somehow. And I'm again going to go back to our demo from last time. And let's see how much we can more or less copy from last time. So we had that fixation that gives you a warning that something's going to come on the screen. And we had 
this variable that was called test, which I think this one was displaying that circle. And then we had this thing called test procedure. So let's just copy all three of those things in there and then see what we need to modify. Um, so fixation, I think this is going to be good. It's a HTML keyboard response. We're going to display that plus sign in the middle of the screen. And there's a bunch of different trial durations for how long that thing's going to be on the screen. Let's just say it's going to be 1,000 or 2,000. So that's one little change. The next part, uh, I'm going to call this display stroop instead of test. I, test, what does that mean? It, it's uh, kind of hard to know. So we could even be more specific. Display stroop item. And then we know what this little plugin is supposed to be doing. Now, this plugin is using the JS Psych image keyboard response. We didn't load that at the top. We do have the HTML keyboard response loaded. So we need to change the, that uh, to one that we have loaded that's going to work. We are going to uh, keep this the same. We're going to use the, uh, yeah, that should be right. Our choices here. So far, we have the choices R and G. These are the keys that you could press to respond red or green. And yeah, the task, this was, I think we could, well, we could maybe call it Stroop. We're gonna save the correct response information that's stored in this variable we also want to save this other stuff, word, color, and congruency. So we will need to expand this. Word will be just like this. We could do color just like this, putting a color in there. And finally, congruency. And I think I had that at lowercase. Need to spell it correctly. And we could leave the unfinished part the same. It's going to tell us whether we are correct by determining whether the given response is the same or different from the correct response that's listed here here okay so the last part is to just double check what's going on in the procedure section so we have test procedure well let's call this Stroop procedure and in our timeline we want to present the fixation this is the timeline for each trial the fixation plug in this one followed by this one called display stroop item. We have to assign the timeline variable that we created. That was previously called test stimuli, but our new timeline variable is called stroop stimuli. So we're gonna change the name of that. Randomize order true, repetitions five, fingers crossed, I think if this is going to work, we should see 10 Stroop trials appear on the screen. And if it doesn't work, we will see some bugs. So let's reload. So far, so good. We've got the instructions. Ooh, all of a sudden the data popped up. We didn't see any Stroop items. Anyone know what the problem is? I think I forgot to push these things to the timeline. Let's try that. Timeline dot push. We can push the Stroop procedure, this thing, to the timeline. 
and don't forget the semicolon. Now reload and let's see what happens. Red, green, red, green. Okay, looks like we're getting our Stroop experiment running. And this is good. The data is shown here. We are coding all the things we want to know that happened on each trial. We can see that this was a Stroop trial. We can see the correct response was a G. We can see that this was the stimulus presented red in green. It was an incongruent trial. And this is how fast I responded. It was correct. And we got that for every single trial here. A typical, a typical experiment would have 96 trials or more um, with usually 50% um, of the trials would be of the congruent type and 50% uh, would be the incongruent type. And we need that many trials typically to have better precision on the a person's mean reaction time in each condition. Okay, actually I'm gonna stop this, tu this tutorial at this point because we have a super basic Stroop experiment and it can be helpful to have examples like this that aren't too complicated yet to, to work off of. So I'm gonna save this one in the uh, week four folder. You'll be able to access this code on GitHub. It's called stroop.html. I need to add this to the blog post. And let's see. Uh, basic Stroop example. Um, should be able to just go like this. And let's check that out. Okay, I'm going to compile that. And we click the link. Hopefully this won't be like last time. Yeah, it starts running the experiment. Great. Okay, so that's going to be up on GitHub. You can check that out. I'm going to do a stretch goal here. I will do a shorter video about this just to give you an example. We were talking about how to create this variable. This variable only has two different Stroop stimuli defined in it. We talked about the issue of uh, doing this by hand versus doing this with a function. And uh, in my next video, I'll show you an example of doing it with a function. And it automates the process of writing this and also potentially removes a role for human error. You could still make an error in the function, but then you can figure out what the error is and the function won't make that mistake any again. So it makes the errors discoverable more easily. And with that, uh, hope this is helpful and we'll see you uh, in the next video.